Hey, this is Pastor Spencer with Racine Bible Church. You're listening to a sermon from a Sunday morning. That song's a prayer asking the Lord to speak and let's continue in prayer as we prepare to open his word. Lord God, we do ask that you would take your word and plant it deep within us. And we ask specifically, Lord, that you would crush all of our pathetic counter arguments against what you have said. Holy God, if we are stiff arming you today, in your mercy, would you break our arm? God, if we have counter arguments for why your word doesn't apply to us, would you show us what pipsqueaks we are and how all of our arguments are sound and fury signifying nothing but our own depravity? Wipe them away that you may rule and reign in our hearts today. For Jesus' sake, amen. Amen. Our subject this morning is authority. In this little series, this is the last week on God and government, we wanted to devote one week just to this subject of authority because it can be very confusing and we all have excuses why authority doesn't apply to us. Begin with a story, it's a true story that's happened to me and I bet it's happened to you. Conversation with a friend begins like this. Maybe you're talking with each other face to face or maybe they're texting you and the conversation begins with this. Let's pick an authority figure in the church. Let's say that your friend says, did you hear about so-and-so? And And it's it's a leader in the church, it's a pastor in the church, maybe local in our community or maybe a a, a kind of a celebrity pastor online. And your friend says, did you hear about so-and-so pastor in the church? What do you think will follow in that conversation? Perhaps... They committed gross sexual sin. Perhaps their greed and how they misappropriated funds and lied about it. Perhaps uh, they were sort of uh, uh, angry and mean to the people that they worked with and they were kind of a bully and that was proven. Those are all good guesses because that conversation has happened with me plenty of times. You know what's a bad guess? If your friend said, did you hear about so-and-so pastor? And you say, no, what, what, what is it? And the conversation is, well, for 40 years, so-and-so has been a faithful pastor and they've had integrity and they've loved their wife and they've served with humility and joy. That's the story. That's never the story. Why? Because we, we always turn our attention to authority when authority fails. And authority does fail and we have to deal with it. But authority as God has created it is meant to be celebrated, appreciated, prayed for, and received with gladness. So I wanna show you this morning four truths about authority, each of which corrects a confusion in our day and age. We'll begin in 1 Peter chapter 2, reading verses 13 through 17. God's word says, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution or every human authority whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good, that is by submitting to authority, by doing good and submitting to authority, that's what it means in the context, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Of the four truths I want to share with you about authority from God's word, the first one is that authority as God designed it is good. Because of sin, our world is confused and conflicted about authority, but authority as God designed it is good. And if you think about it with me, there are few things that our culture is more conflicted and confused about than authority. It's pretty certainly the case that our culture has conflated or collated or made the same authority and authoritarianism. Authoritarianism is is an abuse of authority, wrongfully applied authority. And the way we talk about it, it's almost as if all authority is authoritarian and bad. This is not the case, not biblically and not by God's design. 
Maybe you've heard some of these words. It could be called critical theory. It could be called neo-Marxism. I don't know, it doesn't really matter to me what you call it. What it is, is this assumption. All authority is abusive and all power dynamics are corrupt. That's the assumption behind this thing and that's not true biblically. It's not what we believe about the world and it's not what the Bible reveals from Genesis all the way through to Revelation. Authority is designed by God. God has established roles and rules and lines of authority and this is his good plan. In Genesis chapter two, we have the husband created first and, and called as the leader of the home, the head of the household. We have the wife created second as his helper under his authority. And this is all before the fall into sin in Genesis chapter three. You know, the, the almost hard to pronounce different names of the angels, the cherubim and the seraphim and the archangels, these un fallen angels in heaven who have never sinned and know no sin. There are lines of authority among the perfect, holy, unfallen angels. Authority is a part of God's creation and it is a good part of God's creation. So you wanna call it authority, hierarchy, these power dynamics, these are good authority structures. These are all the way that God created the world in his goodness. Not all power dynamics are corrupt and not all authority is authoritarian and bad. Now the Bible teaches and our experience confirms that authority can certainly be abused and used for sinful purposes and it can become bad and corrupt. But authority as God designed it is good and should be welcomed. That's what Peter is saying here in 1 Peter 2, specifically in verses 13 and 14 and 15. In a fallen world, is authority always inevitably corrupt and harmful? No. In this world, have pastors who are in authority in churches uh, sometimes abused their office sinfully? The answer is yes. Some husbands have used their authority in the home abusively. The Bible says this is an egregious sin that needs to be dealt with. We talked last week about government abusing its authority, infringing on other proper authorities or on God's, against God's law, and that's when government needs to not be submitted to. We dealt with that last week. So it's certainly the case biblically and in our experience that authority can be abused and become bad. But authority qua authority, authority as authority is good and necessary and a part of God's good will for us. What's the solution to bad authority? When authority is abused and becomes corrupt and harms people, what is the solution to bad authority? Think about it. God has established authority so that even when authority becomes bad, God's good, righteous, established authority can then protect those who are being harmed by the bad authority. Think about a coach on an athletic team. If the coach is good, knows what he's doing, and the players on the team submit to the good leadership of the coach, that team can run the plays successfully and win the championship. Think about a a choreographer or a coach for a woman who's a a dancer or a figure skater or something like that. She may wanna just do her own thing all the time, but if she follows the instruction of her coach and her choreographer, then she's free, she's free to nail the routine perfectly and win the competition. Peter says, don't use your freedom as a cover-up, verse 16, for evil and your own self-serving desires. The, the, The freedom that we have is freedom underneath the authority of God and God's good authorities in our lives. And this leads to the kinds of lives that are filled, verse 15, with goodness and that put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Authority is good and necessary. 
To show you God's good design for authority, I'd ask you to turn from 1 Peter back to 2 Samuel chapter 23. That's in the Old Testament. If you're in the book of Psalms, you have to keep going backwards. And then it goes 1 and 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, 1 and 2 Chronicles. So if you get to Chronicles or Kings, keep going back and we'll be in 2 Samuel chapter 23. Significantly, these are the last public words of David. Psalm uh, 2 Samuel 23 verse 1 says these are the last words of King David. These are the last public words of King David. And he gives, uh, I, maybe I could say this about every text. I feel like saying this about this text. I love what this text says and I love how this text says it. The Bible is so beautiful in its didactic teaching, so beautiful. Look at what he says, 2 Samuel 23. Now these are the last words of David. The oracle of David, the son of Jesse, the oracle of the man who was raised on high, the anointed of the God of Jacob, the sweet psalmist of Israel, the spirit of the Lord speaks by me. His word is on my tongue. The God of Israel has spoken. The rock of Israel has said to me, when one rules justly over men, ruling in the fear of God. He dawns on them like the morning light, like the sun shining forth on a cloudless morning, like rain that makes grass to sprout from the earth. You see, the middle of verse three says, when one rules justly. What that means is when authority functions the way that God has designed for it to function, when good authority created by a good God and delegated by a good God functions the way that it should, then there's justice, there's the fear of the Lord, and there's the dawning of the sun on a cloud this morning, and there's the rain that makes grass to sprout from the earth. What a beautiful text. Two lines about authority in verse three. One rules justly over men, ruling in the fear of God. So first, authority is to be just, it's to be fair and righteous. And second, authorities under the fear of God. That is, authority itself is under the authority of God. The, author, the, uh, the, the king in authority doesn't do whatever he wants. He does what's proper and wise under the authority of God. So these two things are said about authority. The first thing that's said is one rules justly over men. What is justice? Justice is what is <clears throat> right and true and fair according to God's standard of justice. Biblically defined, not popularly defined based on the king's whims and not popularly defined based on some democratic process. Justice is justice. And this is a, this is a key point of cultural confusion because we've been told almost not so much told directly as sort of told indirectly by Disney and Hollywood and pop music and everything else, that love is what you feel. And we've also come to believe that justice is kind of the same thing. If someone feels like they've been treated unjustly, then they must have been treated unjustly, but that's not the case. Justice is and ought, justice ought never to be defined based on someone's subjective feelings. Justice is justice based on what's righteous, what is factual. Justice is the same for men and women, the same for, for, for every culture, every ethnicity, every income level. Justice is based on objective reality of fact. It's not based on subjective feelings. And so he says there, one rules justly over men ruling in the fear of God. And then you see the beautiful descriptions in verse four, three word pictures, like the dawning of the morning light, warm and gentle in the glow of the morning. The second picture is like the sun shining forth on a, on a, in a bright, bright blue sky. And the third picture, do you hear it? Like rain that makes grass to sprout from the earth. Hear the patter? of lightly falling rain. Not a hailstorm that's gonna do damage and you have to call your insurance agent. That's not what this is. The pattern of lightly falling rain so that if a little plant, a little flower, it, it, the, the rain falls so gently 
that the flower can be nourished by it. The rain doesn't fall so hard that the petals of the flower are ripped apart. This is, this is kingly authority that is strong and carries a sword, but is applied with the wisdom of gentleness in each situation specifically. So if the first truth about authority is that God designed it and it's good, let's get a second truth about authority from these pictures here in 2 Samuel 23. And the second truth about authority is this. Godly authority gives more than it takes. Godly authority provides for life and makes it more fruitful rather than stealing from and making less fruitful. That's what the end of verse four says. It's like rain that makes the grass to grow. Good authority gives more than it takes and good authority provides for life and makes it more fruitful. It doesn't choke out life and make it less fruitful. Good authority doesn't steal the fruit for itself. Good authority uses that authority so that more fruit can blossom and grow. Authority doesn't steal life but creates it. When God put the man and the woman in dominion over the world, he said to them specifically, be fruitful and multiply. Authority doesn't steal life, it creates it. Bad authority steals and corrupts. What did Jesus say about the devil? He's the thief that has come to steal and kill and destroy. Bad authority steals, oppresses, usurps, exploits, violates, undermines, destroys, dehumanizes and annihilates. But good authority creates, nourishes, builds up, strengthens, disciplines, corrects, encourages, gives opportunity. Good authority brings fruitfulness and life like a light rain on the plants that helps them to grow. Listen to uh, Psalm 72. Psalm 72 is a psalm written about the, the blessing of a godly king. And Psalm 72, written of Solomon, says this, give the king your justice, O God. There's justice again, justice from God as he righteously defines it. Give the king your justice, O God, and your righteousness to the royal son. May he judge your people with righteousness and your poor with justice. Justice is the same for rich or for poor. No one's above the law. Money shouldn't buy your way out of justice. And then look at the fruitfulness in verse three of Psalm 72. Let the mountains bear prosperity for the people and the hills in righteousness. May he defend the cause of the poor of the people, give deliverance to the children of the needy and crush the oppressor. May they fear you while the sun endures and as long as the moon throughout all generations. May he like rain that falls on the mown grass, like showers that water the earth. In his days may the righteous flourish and peace abound till the moon be no more. Godly, kingly authority helps everyone under that authority to be more fruitful in righteousness. It certainly squelches and causes not to grow unrighteousness and wickedness and criminality, but it causes to grow and to blossom and to bloom those who are doing what's right in the fear of the Lord. That's the second truth about godly authority is that godly authority gives more than it takes and it provides for life and makes life more fruitful. Quickly, we can move to a third truth about authority, and that's this. Every earthly authority is always accountable to a higher authority. Here's the solution to bad authority. Every earthly authority is always accountable to a higher authority. Good, godly authority is not unaccountable, but good, godly authority submits itself to a higher authority. That is to say that the one in authority is always under authority. The only one to whom that doesn't apply is God. The one in earthly authority is always a steward because the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And I am a steward. Anyone in authority is a steward of what God's given. A mother is in authority over her children, but those children are a heritage from the Lord. Her authority is a stewardship from the Lord. Good, godly authority is never unaccountable. It is always itself under the authority of the higher authority. It's only as I am under God's authority that I am safely in authority over the things that God has put me over. That's the umbrella of safety. Second Samuel, remember 23, says the king reigns in the fear of the Lord. So the king is under the authority of the Lord. 
1 Peter 2.14 says that the emperor and the governor sent by him are sent by God to, to punish evil and to promote righteousness. So the king and the emperor are not free to just insanely do whatever they want to do. They're under the authority of God who's defined what's right and what's wrong. I love how this comes out in Deuteronomy 17, if you want to turn there, Deuteronomy is even further back than 2 Samuel. In Deuteronomy 17, and this is another place in the Hebrew scripture where I love what's said and I love how it's said. It's beautiful. The way that this comes up in this text, it's a marvelous picture. You can just picture it in your mind, what it would have looked like for this to happen. Deuteronomy 17 is, a, is, a, is laws concerning Israel's kings. And it says in Deuteronomy 17 and verse 14, when you come to the land that the Lord your God is giving you and you possess it and dwell in it and then say, I will set a king over me like all the nations that are around. You may indeed set a king over you. And he says the, the king should, should be chosen from the citizens of Israel. The king shouldn't acquire a whole bunch of wealth for himself. And then look at verse 18. Authority can be an abstract concept. That's why at the beginning of the sermon I talked about like a, like a, like a choreographer leading a dancer. We need, we need specific illustrations of what it looks like. And look at, look at this illustration of what it looks like. Verse 18, picture it. When the king sits on the throne, Deuteronomy 17, verse 18. When the king sits on the throne of his kingdom, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of this law approved by the Levitical priests and it shall be with him and he shall read in it all the days of his life that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of this law and these statutes and doing them. Can you picture that book, that scroll, how, how um, smudgy and sweat-stained it must have become? Because the king is literally commanded to touch it every day of his reign and look in it. You talk about a Bible that's falling apart. He's commanded to look at it every day of his reign because he's under the authority of the word of God. But picture it. The king would have had a palace with, with, with rooms full of scribes who would write down everything for him. He's not allowed to delegate this to a servant or a scribe. Well, what if the scribe had better writing and could do calligraphy? No! The king has to write it himself in his own hand. And notice what he has to write. The law of God. He has to write it in his own hand and he's not writing. Yeah, how many times have we heard of those in authority say this? Uh, these are all the reasons why the rules don't apply to me right now. People in authority are way good at that. You ever, have an el you ever encounter an elder or a pastor in the church who is making arguments to you about why the clear teaching of the Bible does not apply? Run, run. Don't walk, run. Every earthly king, every earthly prime minister, every earthly president, every earthly circuit court judge and supreme court judge is under the authority of God's written revelation. Everyone is. The king had to write it down letter for letter from the Hebrew so that he would be careful to observe it every day of his life. I love, and you should love too, how Titus 1 and 1 Timothy 3 say at least two different things. One, they say elders have authority in the church. And the second thing that Titus 1 and 1 Timothy 3 says is that every elder is himself under the authority of the holiness and the clear standards and the clear teaching of God's word. <clears throat> our elders are usually working through a book. Actually, at our meeting a week ago today, we finished the, the book that we've been studying. It's a book about team leadership. It's called The Plurality Principle. It's by uh, Pastor Dave Harvey. And this is, um, this is three sentences from that book. To serve as part of a healthy elder plurality, each elder must know his role and be willing to come under authority and learn humility 
and be willing to think about his own gifts and his own position through the lens of what serves the whole church rather than his personal agenda. Each and every elder must learn to lead under some, alongside some others, and over others still. I think that's right. Every earthly authority is under the higher authority. And then the fourth and final point to make about authority is that good authority is always necessary. We should pray for it, provide for it, encourage it and submit to it. Good authority is always necessary. It's needed. It's desperately needed in our day and age. We cannot really avoid authority. Philosophically, it's not whether, it's which. It's not whether there will be an authority. It's which authority will function. And will we, be, will we be honest about the authority that's functioning? And will we hold the authority that's functioning accountable to God's principles? Can't really avoid it. This is because the solution to bad authority is what? The solution to bad authority is what? The solution to bad authority is not no authority. John Lennon got that and a lot of other things wrong. The solution to bad authority is not no authority. The solution to bad authority is good authority. It's always necessary. Those who have been wronged or abused by authority may have a hard time understanding, trusting, coming under authority. Maybe it takes some time. I'm sure it takes some gentleness and some patience. But being under godly authority is God's good design for each and every person, no matter what your background is, no matter what's happened to you. Just because bad authority has wronged you doesn't mean that now you, 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 can, uh, you can have a problem with authority for the rest of your life. You actually need good godly authority. A a ask any child who was abused and who was just didn't have the wherewithal to, 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 to take care of themselves. It was righteous, good, godly authority that came in and rescued them. The solution to bad authority has to be good authority. You know, we, we're confused, like I said, they have different labels for it about the cultural Marxism of power dynamics or whatever, but the, the, the point is that in, in our cultural confusion, we've, we've, become, we've, we've become very uh, comfortable with the, the, the kind of common argument that authoritative teaching is dangerous. Authoritative teaching is dangerous. So you see somebody make a speech and say, authoritative teaching is dangerous. And what you want to say to that person is, well, are you teaching me that? And why are you the one giving the speech? Isn't that a, a, a statement of authority? <laughs> or to, we, we've become so used in our culture to saying, to saying that, that certainty, certainty about things, certainty is, is divisive and harmful. And you want to say to the person who says that certainty is divisive and harmful, well, friend, are you certain about that? And if you are, are you not harming me by telling me how certain you are that certainty is harmful? It's not whether we will have an authority. It's not whether we will submit to an absolute truth. It's just which one, which one. And I'm tired of seeing Christians submit to Satan's lies. There is no more time for that. Authority cannot be avoided. It must be done right. The answer is not dismissing all authority. The answer is right authority. So, uh, so, this, so as it, this as in all things, we look to Jesus. Deuteronomy 17 said that the, the king ha had to write down the law and follow the law. And Israel had a couple of good kings and Israel and Judah had a whole boatload of horrific kings. But even the good kings that Israel and Judah had were never enough. They were never enough. We were always looking forward to Jesus. Moses needed a leader. Israel needed a leader to bring them out of Egypt. And so they had Moses. And he did a lot of things right. And he did a few things wrong. We needed a king. We needed a deliverer. And, and none of them is, is ever the, the final one. The prophecy about Jesus in Jeremiah 23. Jeremiah 23 says that Jesus is the righteous branch of David's line. 
Jesus is the righteous branch of David's line who shall reign as king and he shall deal wisely and he shall execute justice and righteousness shall be in all the land and in his day Judah shall be secure and his name shall be the Lord our righteousness. There will be a king who in every decision perfectly manifests the reality of the law of God and that king is Jesus and oh how we wait for him. Oh how we wait for him. And we meaning Christians and and back in the Old Testament, the Jews, how long have we been waiting? Well, since Genesis 3. How quick did it take us to to, to ruin the planet? Not very long. And so in Genesis 6, every thought of the intent of every person's heart is only evil continually. And then then, then the the world is recreated after the flood. And then in Exodus, the authority of of Egypt is just abusing God's people. And we're saying, how long? When will be delivered? How long? How long? And all through, we have the the law and the prophets showing us what to do. Then we have Israel not doing it and going into exile. There's this gap in the middle. And then the New Testament comes and Jesus is born. And what happens right after Jesus is born? the earthly authority in the region campaigns for infanticide and Rachel is weeping with no one to comfort her because her children are being killed by the king. And we say, how long? When will these earthly kings stop corrupting everything? And then Jesus goes to the cross and then Jesus rises again and he says to his church, the gates of hell aren't gonna prevail against you and, and you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna be my church and you're gonna take over the, 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 from Jerusalem to Judea to the uttermost parts of the earth. And then what happens? As soon as the apostles start preaching, Acts chapter four, authority comes in and slams them in jail. Over and over again, we see that the, that the church says, how long, when will authority stop being corrupt and when will Jesus show us the way? All the way to the last book of the Bible. The, this unforgettable cry in the book of Revelation, it's not the angels in the heavens, the cry comes from under, from under the altar. And the cry is an interrogative, how long? And the ones making the cry are the martyrs whom earthly authorities have slain with the sword because they wouldn't bow the knee and, and, and they, they continue to proclaim that Jesus is Lord. And it, it's, the, it's, it's, the, it's the, the decapitated martyrs who are put back together by Jesus who cry out from under the altar, how long? And finally, in the end of Revelation, the king of all kings with a sword in his mouth and a robe dipped in blood, he will come and he will make all things right. Amen. Do not stand against him in any way. Bow the knee to Jesus today, today, and every day. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as we have opened your word, don't let us Harden our hearts to your call, to your call to salvation, your call to sanctification, your call to obedience. Lord Jesus, be at work through the preaching of your word and the building up of your church. Pray for those who are in authority. Pray for those here who have been mistreated by authority. Help them to seek righteousness. Help us to help them. Lord Jesus, help us to walk with you in the light of your truth that that we might walk in your way of righteousness. Be the people you've called us to be. For Jesus' sake, amen. Amen. To find out more about our ministry, contact us at racinebible.org. Thank you for listening.